Blues, anybody have a flag? All right. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, thanks everybody. All right, we'll do a roll call. Yeah, sorry about that, my computer just messed up on me. All right, so I know that uh, Chair Crone is not gonna be here, so Commissioner Huxford? Here. Commissioner Davis? Here. Commissioner, Commissioner Osland? Present. Commissioner Holt? Here. Commissioner Dewar? Here. All right, so may I get a motion to um, excuse Chair Cronin from the meeting? So moved. Second. second. A motion and a second to um, approve. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained. Now it's the vote. All right, this is where we have guest business. So I want to acknowledge anybody that wants to speak to the commission on anything other than the public hearing that we'll be having. There'll be a time for public comment at that point. If anyone has anything other than the public hearing, that'd be nice to hear now. Can you help me if you see anybody or not? I don't. All right, so we'll move on. Next item is approving the minutes from July 7th. Um, hopefully commissioners have had a chance to review. Do anybody have any changes they would like to propose? Are you not going to get a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Second. A motion a second to approve the minutes from July 7th. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Unanimous. So now we'll be moving on to the public hearing for the impact fees. I will open the, the public hearing. Advise everybody that the staff will give a presentation. The commissioners will then uh, discuss it with staff and then we'll open it to the public if there's anyone that's comment. So with that, I'll turn it over to, I'm gonna bring this, who's, uh, who's got this public hearing, I'm sorry. County Manager Levitan. Uh, Manager Levitan, thank you. All right, thank you, Vice Chair Welch. I'm gonna share my screen. We'll do a really quick PowerPoint. So we are here tonight for land use application 2021-0133. It's a proposed land use code amendment to a couple of sections related to impact fees. Um, just as a reminder, we had the Planning Commission had a work session on impact fees back on June 16th. Uh, impact fees are one-time charges uh, that are used to help fund public facility or capital improvements. Um, just a little bit about the specifics of them. They're required to fund system improvements and they must be identified in either the city's or the school district's uh, capital facilities plan. Um, the, and the current uh, municipal code regulates school impact fees, traffic impact fees and park impact fees. Um, and so just a little bit about the proposal which is shown in attachment one of your packet tonight. Um, it's the, the amendments are mainly being driven uh, to reflect recent annexations, um, including the recently finalized Southeast Interlocal Annexation, uh, which, be, which was finalized on Monday, effective as of last week. Um, and we had originally talked on June 16th about doing potential amendments to all three being school, traffic, and parks. Uh, at this time, we're just looking at doing updates to the school and traffic impact fees and we'll be exploring uh, some amendments to the park impact fees section in the future. Um, and just there, the proposed amendments are relatively limited in scope um, as shown in attachment one. Um, as it relates to the school impact fees, the major changes are removing specific references 
to the Lake Stevens School District and instead including a new definition and new language that uh, references just a uh, quote unquote district. Um, that was a suggestion from uh, Vice Chair Welch, which was definitely a good idea. Um, also extending the deadline to utilize school impact fees from the current six years uh, that's identified in the code to the maximum 10 years as allowed by state law. Uh, moving on to the traffic impact fees and the proposed amendments. Uh, the major amendment is to figure 14.112-I, uh, uh, which um, assigns traffic impact zones to recent annexations dating back uh, to the Redora and the uh, previous Southeast uh, Island interlocal annexations, which had not been assigned traffic impact zones. Um, and then the proposed code language would also automatically assign uh, the tra traffic impact zone of directly contiguous areas to properties when they're annexed. Um, and so I did wanna call out on this map, looking at the map on the left, uh, that is the existing map that's shown in figure 14. 0.112-I, um, and we have identified the new map there on the right. I did want to note that I had kind of uh, missed this at first, but the actual, the boundaries of traffic impact zone uh, three should actually end at 20th Street. Uh, in this area in the southeast corner, we did not annex the areas south of 20th Street Southeast, so that is an amendment we're going to need to make before we bring it to city council. So when the planning commission is considering making the recommendation, I would advise that they include um, a proposed revision to figure 14-112-I to show uh, the current city boundaries, which in that Southeast corner extend only down to 20th Street Southeast. Um, just a little bit about the findings and the staff recommendation. Um, as noted in the staff report, it meets the proposed amendment meets all the approval criteria for land use code amendments. Um, it meets all of the SEPA and public notice requirements and staff is recommending that commission forward a recommendation to city council to, to amend uh, the municipal code per attachment one. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. And I can go back to the map if there are any uh, questions about that. All right, thank you, Planning Manager of Liverton. Do any commissioners have any questions of staff regarding what we've gotten so far? I, I have one and I had to, I'm sorry, but I had someone that was knocking on my door. Um, there is, I had somebody ask the question from the community, um, if impact fees are at the plat per, um, are at the plat permit status, not the building permit status. And this may not apply when it comes to the schools, but probably for transportation. And I'm wondering if that was covered in the moment that I ran upstairs. So yeah, we're not proposing any changes to when impact fees are collected. Um, they typically are at the at the building permit st stage. Um, we do have code language that allows for deferral of impact fees, but um, I believe that we haven't had that used um, since we made that change a few years ago. Russ would be able to speak to that, um, but we aren't proposing any changes to that section uh, of the of the municipal code. And then my own question, and this is just for my curiosity, it's changed from six years to 10 years on the, for the um, schools, if they do, don't use the money within that, is that simply to allow them more time to allocate? It is correct. That's to match state law that basically requires it to either be um, spent or at least um, earmarked within that 10 year period or else it needs to be refunded. I would dare say there's probably never a refund, but I appreciate that. Thanks for the clarification. Any other commissioners have any questions right now, staff at this time? Hearing none, I'd like to open the uh, public comment portion of the public hearing. At this time, we'll allow the public to comment regarding this 
public hearing regarding the, the uh, impact fees. So if anybody's got anything they would like to add, now's the time. I don't hear anybody, I don't say anything. Do you say anything, Jenny? All right, I'll close the uh, public comment portion of the hearing and open it back up to the commissioners uh, for any more questions or any proposed action. I'll ask, uh, David, is there, a, I know it's kind of really part of the public hearing, but on a section, when the when this area was still part of the county, um, they collected uh, these fees. Did they, do they have theirs in a, and a zone like we do, or is it countywide when they do, when they collect the foot, the, the fees or right at their level? I'm not quite clear. Uh, I'm not quite sure how many different uh, zones they have. I don't know if Russ would have that information if that's, if it's a countywide fee or if they have different ones for different parts of the different UGAs and MUGAs. I don't have that off the top of my head, but I'll do a quick search to see if I can um, find that answer. It's okay. It was, it was more of a curiosity thing since I know they've been, you know, you collect fees over time in some of these areas. It's kind of all those ideas if there's unused fees, wouldn't it be great if they could come to, come to the zones that they're going to be used? But that was just a uh, generic question on my own. It has nothing to do with this hearing and I uh, okay. probably shouldn't have done it, but I, my curiosity was overwhelming me. So anybody has any other questions or comments? Um, I'm willing to entertain a motion. I make the motion that we forward to council is prepared. I'll second that. Do we wanna add with the revision of the uh, map, right? Yes, uh, correct, absolutely. Thank you. I um, might um, suggest to the commission if I can that we actually do show future TIZ areas and just um, demarcate those in a different way. So it is clear that at some point to go along with the text that those will be part of the, the TIZ and those could be cross hatched, those annexation areas rather than just shown as blank. Wouldn't that come back to us though at that point? We wouldn't need to do a code amendment if we, um, So I will revise my motion that it be uh, forwarded to council as prepared with the um, amended map to reflect both current and future proposed annexations. Thank you. I'll second, or did we already get a second? We'd have to have a re-second on that because it's a change of the motion. Okay, well then I second the revised right. motion. All right, so we have a a motion and a second to approve. All in favor saying, or is there any other discussion? I'm sorry, before we do this. All right, all signify saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained? The ayes have it. We move on to our next thing, which will be discussion items. And we will move to Assistant Planner Needham on the permissible use table. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Today we are bringing back the permissible use table for the final work session before we move on to the public hearing phase. Um, so last time we had a great discussion regarding storage facilities, the multifamily residential zone, and home occupations and industrial zones. And for the most part, we will continue to have that discussion today. Um, we've done some research as directed by the commission and have some updated drafts to share. Um, so first off, we've removed storage facilities from the public slash semi-public zone, and we are proposing requiring an administrative conditional use permit or ACUP within the light industrial and general industrial industrial zones, abbreviated LI and GI respectively. Several commissioners had questions about the economic anal analysis that would be required to cite a storage facility. Um, because storage facilities are often a very land intensive and have very few employees actually working on site, the analysis would need to demonstrate that the storage facility does not reduce the city's economic viability um, and would not contribute to the city's inability to meet the long-term employment goals, um, which are cited in our comprehensive plan. Um, 
We also discuss adding restaurants and retail as outright permitted uses within those industrial zones. Commissioners generally agreed that um, retail uses should require an ACUP while restaurants should be outright permitted in order to support the workers that work in those zones. Um, and also commissioners requested to know how many single family zones or locate single, single family homes, I should say, are located within the multifamily residential zoning district or MFR in order to make a better informed decision as to whether to continue to allow them or prohibit them. Um, just as a reminder, currently a minimum of 15 dwelling units per acre is imposed within that zone, um, which would not allow more single family residences in most cases. So after we reviewed the GIS and assessor data, we found the following breakdown of single family homes within that zoning district. So 25 of the lots had single family detached, 77 has attached air condo, or sorry, detached air condo style dwellings. And I think this was mostly the cross water development. Um, four lots had two detached SFRs each and then um, 10 were vacant. So it is important to note that regardless, um, these existing single family dwellings can be replaced and maintained as single family homes. Um, so in essence, they do have legal non-conforming status. Um, and so lastly, home occupations have been added as outright permitted in industrial zones, as there are many legal non-conforming single family residences in those industrial zones. Um, so I have sent the proposed drafts to the Chamber of Commerce for a review. Um, depending on the end of this meeting, we may um, have another work session or we may um, like to immediately begin public hearings. Either way, um, with that, I'll pass it off to commissioners for further discussion as to whether to allow um, single family residences in the MFR zone or any questions and comments on the other items. Um, thank you for all that. Uh, the commissioners like to start this discussion or make any recommendations to what we've already gotten before so far. I, I did have a couple of questions um, based on some of the content in here, um, if I may. Of course. On um, page 19 of our packet, it's um, former section C, now section B. We talk about uh, the following activities um, as being generally considered uh, accessory. Of new B, section three, we talk about renting out of rooms uh, within a residential dwelling for a period of 30 days or more consistent with the family, the definition of family in Lake Stevens Municipal Code 14.08.010. Our intent here, I believe, is to allow the um, the renting of rooms exclusively to family members. Is that is that my read? Just so that we're not creating like um, uh, some sort of um, in res in a residential zone non-conforming apartment or anything like that. Hey, did you want to take that one? that up. Um, I think the intent was to kind of um, align that with our definition of family, um, which a family can be currently within our the definition section, um, up to six unrelated individuals, or else it can be, you know, uh, a family that is related. Um, so, so my recommendation on that then is maybe that we in this section lead with, you know, that that you can do, that you can renting out a room to somebody who is consistent with the definition of family at, under Lake Stevens Municipal Code. So it doesn't appear that you're allowing for the creation of some sort of flop house or something like that. Um, uh, I think that would just kind of clean up that sentence. It just kind of re read awkward to me, you know, with how it was edited. Okay. Yeah, no, we can definitely look at ways to improve that language and try to make it a lot more clear. And then the only other the only other thing that um, uh, we had was in attachment two, page twenty two. 
when we talk about um, home occupations, um, while I understand you know what we're what we're aiming for with that and, and all that makes sense, do we also need to have uh, I don't know a carve out or an exception for individuals who are te just telecommuting? Um, because I mean, effectively, you can be telecommuting from your regular job and doing work from home um, that may appear to be a home occupation, even though you're not actually needing a business license to do that work or, or um, uh, be running your own business. Yeah, that's something that we can look at uh, if there are concerns that, um, you know, if you're not operating your own business and you're just telecommuting, if, if you think that there would be some concerns, I, I I don't think that that would, you know, fall under the home occupation because you're not technically running your own business, you're telecommuting. But if, if there's any proposed language or we can think about ways to kind of explicitly note that that wouldn't be something that would be subject to the home occupation standards. Yeah, my only concern there is, you know, to avoid it, you know, a nitpicky neighbor kind of thing from from picking on somebody who's working from home. Okay. That's all I had. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else have any thing they wish to add in the discussion? Go ahead, Jennifer. Um, Oh, thanks, Commissioner Hexford. Um, my, I had a quick comment about the, the actual chart on pages 35 and 36 of our packet. And I think it's actually kind of a substantive conversation that, that we might be having. Um, I was looking at on the, uh, page 35, the where uh, under a single family detached site builder modular where the uses are permitted. And then the next page, the IDU um, section, there's um, under the MFR and the MU, it looks like the P, the red line for the P has been crossed out. So I just wanted to, that might lead us into the conversation about um, accessory dwelling units, but I couldn't tell from the red line if it was red line added and I'm just seeing it crossed out or if it was red line removed. I don't, I'm having trouble reading it, reading that. That's showing as, as crossed out um, and we wanted to have that discussion so we can basically, we want to get planning commission's recommendation there. We had had that discussion kind of about allowing for the detached single family residences within multifamily residential. And then we had also had kind of a separate but related discussion about allowing for accessory dwelling units for what would have be legal non-conforming single family residences in the MFR zone because accessory dwelling units are only allowed accessory to detached single family residences. Mm -hmm. So if the consensus from the planning commission is that they want that to continue to be permitted for um, in those situations, then we would we would continue to permit that. I think that was um, from my memory. I don't know if we had consensus, but I would weigh in on including the ADUs, um, continuing to permit them. I think the um, cleanest way for us to do that is just to footnote, you know, just um, as David just mentioned that they would be allowed as accessory to any existing single family uses. Okay. Any other questions or comments? I actually have a couple, if I may. Of course. We're all being so polite tonight. We've all been off for enough time that we're all being so polite, if I may. Uh, Chair Dewar started that, and now I'm doing it too. Um, or uh, Commissioner Dewar. Uh, in, on page 32, uh, when we're putting in 1444230 about odors, and the, um, a panel of five healthy noses would consider a bad odor. My concern being, um, and I don't know how to word this, it's more of an enforcement issue, um, but to put something in that we're not enforcing um, is concerning to me. 
um, and this has been going on for quite some time. So I suppose the issue is we leave it there, but are we going to enforce it? That might be a question that can't be answered on this call, but um, I wanted to bring that up. Hearing no response, I'll continue on. Um, page 36 of the actual table. And this is where I needed to spend some time. Um, there are two questions. Well, there, there's a clarification that I need. We talk about Oxford House. Can I get a clarification of Oxford House? Yeah, so an Oxford House is uh, typically they occur in single family residential neighborhoods. It's essentially geared kind of a clean and sober facility. It's a specific program for maintaining and providing kind of an environment um, for those with identified drug and alcohol addictions, which are covered, um, acknowledged as uh, disabilities. And so there is some case law specifically from the city of Edmonds that those are permitted within uh, single family residential zones that they need to be treated essentially the same as, as single family residences. And do, and they need to be, do they need to be zoned in every single one of these zones that they're listed in right now? Uh, they, they basically, they need to be allowed where single family residences are allowed. There, there's a federal preemption that would allow them under the Fair Housing Act in any residential zone. Okay, I suspect that that's going to land like a lead brick. Um, and I wish that there was a way that we could get in front of it, knowing that that's federally mandated makes that a little bit more difficult. But I would hope that that would be um, something that is, um, that the city is aware that this is, um, somebody's next door neighbor is not gonna be very happy. And then following that same page down, and I, I brought this up at the last meeting and it didn't make the top three or, or four that, that Jill was so kind to respond about, but the temporary encampments. Um, and if you follow that, um, which I thought it was one, but it's 11, if you can look at it, and it's talking about uh, that it has to be on a church parking lot and it has to be endorsed by the church and there's all of this lighting and everything that needs to go on. Um, but my concern there is, and follow my thought, and Marysville just went through this, my concern is that um, these churches that I think would be capable of doing something that would want to potentially be willing to do something like this, but up to residential um, um, uh, residences. And, and what constitutes a church. So we have churches that are, you know, at the Boys and Girls Club on, the, on Sundays or at the, you know, gymnasium on Sundays or whatever, and what constitutes a church. And is the, is the city opening up a can of worms much like Marysville did when the church just down from Walmart there did this just very, very recently. And over 600 people um, came out against doing this temporary encampment for all the reasons that we've discussed before. Public transportation, no social services, but it's up to residential areas. In that case has school, uh, you know, a school down the street. In all of these cases, um, it, it started as one thing, but can become a very different thing if the city doesn't get in front of it early. And I'm wondering if maybe this could be something that the, the um, city and staff looks at a little bit further and maybe goes down the rabbit hole a little bit more before we um, put this uh, uh, table to rest. I, I would suggest that all this does is carry forward what was already approved by the city council and the planning commission in 2018 after um, a significant amount of analysis to make this code as palatable as it could be for Lake Stevens. Unfortunately, this is another one where we have, in this case, state, um, state mandates that require that we allow for temporary housing. And the Planning Commission, again, in 2018, did its work 
to establish these regula regulations that were then passed by city council. So this isn't new code. This is just carrying it forward into this table. Um, I, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to No, that, that's fine. That's, that's just my point. We just carried forward existing code into this table. So there's really not a point of refinement. Um, okay. Um, and I appreciate that. I remember 2018 well. Um, you know, for example, if the little building on Lundine Park was approved to be a church, I'm just, I'm just throwing this out there. And, and that it's concerning that temporary encampments in all of these zones um, be, be permissible. Um, and, and there are a lot of caveats. And, and Russ, I remember, like I say, I remember well all the caveats that are there. There will be a lot of, of hurdles to cross to do that. But a temporary encampment, as we've seen in all of the cities that have allowed these, they never really go away. And we don't have the resources in Lake Stevens to maintain um, um, a, a, a community on an ongoing basis and do it in a way that's both kind to the community and kind to the, the residents of that, of that temporary encampment space. So um, again, if there's any conversation with a couple of our city council members on the, on the call tonight, if there's any conversation that could be had to get in front of this in any way possible um, to be fair to all, I would appreciate and, um, and hope that that would be done. Um, I'm just gonna look at my notes real quick. Um, on number 38, I've got one more real quick. Number 38 here, um, we still have marijuana retail um, permitted in certain areas. Um, and I'm assuming that that tiny little four is saying that it can't be done because we've already reached our max of the one in Lake Stevens. Is that correct? It just provides the cross-reference to the code section that deals with marijuana restrictions, which by extension does talk about the, the cap of one facility and the overall cap for um, production and processing. Okay. Um, with that, uh, those answer the questions that I had initially. I would simply say though that I would like to spend a little bit more time and hope to get more feedback from the community on this um, if needed before we go to public comment. Thank you. I would, I would say wouldn't the public comment come at a public hearing? That would be where we I would get the Tom, as, soon, as soon as I said that, I was saying the same thing twice. So I <laughs> thank you for calling me out. But what I was saying is I would like to hear public comment. On this. Thank you. So any other um, commissioners have any questions or comments that they wish on this discussion item? All right, hearing none. So are we comfortable moving this to the next phase, which is a public hearing, right? If I understand it right. And staff can correct me if I'm wrong. That's correct. All right. And that, that public hearing is in the middle of September, right? Did, did I see in the notes that we were proposing that for September something? Yeah, it hasn't been formally scheduled or formally noticed, but that is loosely the tentative date. Um, my concern only being that um, the first meeting that's scheduled in September is just as everybody's coming back from Labor Day and school is starting. So to hope that we would have public comment um, that week, I think would be wishful thinking. Okay. So we could either do it as a, if we do a second meeting in September or do it the first meeting in October. Is anything time sensitive um, regarding this for the council? Not particularly, just wanting to move on with the rest of this year's work program. Sure. So I guess, well, do we, I know it's kind of early to know, would we know if we're going to 
did we plan on having a second meeting in September or not? Or do you see the workload not needing one? I'll defer to David on that question. <clears throat> yeah, so I think it's, I think we could potentially just have the one meeting in September um, where we would, I need to bring back the last couple items related to the comp plan before we move that into the public hearing stage in, in, Oct in October and November. If Commissioner Huxford was, I'm assuming she was referencing the 15th, I know that my kids start on September 8th. Um, so if we had, and I don't know how it is for Lake Stevens School District or for Snohomish School District, I'm assuming it's probably at about the same time. Um, what, Commissioner Huxford, were you concerned about having the meeting on the 15th? I, I just didn't know if we were having a second meeting in September. So I did not want it on the 1st. And yeah. if we were not going to have a second meeting in September, I was hoping that we would move it to the beginning of October, whatever the 6th is or whatever. I think if commissioners are available, we could not, we could just have the optional meeting, just the meeting on the 15th and have, um, there are a couple items that we need to have on there. Um, but we could have this public hearing call plan discussion. Um, and then depending on um, kind of what's, if we need to come back on Melissa's item, which is on non-conforming use, that could occupy the, just that second meeting on the 15th. I have no problem with the second meeting in September if everybody else is fine with that. Second and only meeting. So no meeting on the first, just a oh, meeting yeah. on the 15th. That'd be fine to me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I think I think we all kind of agree with that idea. We'll just come back on the 15th and get all this wrapped up. Uh, all right. So we're going to close on that discussion item and move on to uh, Senior Planner Place and the non-conforming uses. Great, good evening. Sounds like everything's wrapped up. I really don't even need to uh, go over this with you. I'm just kidding. <laughs> we'll just bring it back on the 15th and there it'll be good. Now, um, so this is a briefing this evening. Just uh, wanted to have some informal discussion on the draft code that we've prepared and included in the staff report for you. We introduced this uh, formally back in June and so skipped the July meeting and bringing it back to you here in August. And um, really what I did was took the input that you provided from the last meeting and use that to form this draft code uh, uh, along with the goals that the city has for the non-conforming code update. And so attachment one is the draft code. Attachment two is the other code sections of um, the city's municipal code where non-conforming shows up. So you can read through those provisions. Um, in attachment two, I think one section in that attachment is highlighted and the idea there is that that may change depending on the discussion of the sub areas. So it's really highlighted to um, come back to that one and potentially revise that. But I just wanted to go over sort of the highlights of what we talked about and what this new code incorporates. So last time we had talked about certain approaches for consideration, including abandonment, enlargement, reconstruction and restoration termination of the uses, amortization, vested rights, and the benign versus detrimental nonconformities. So this new code basically, um, in attachment one, you can see it struck out the nonconforming situation, which was the term at the top, and we're just calling it nonconformity. So everything falls under the header of nonconformities. And if it's helpful, I can just bring up, I can just um, share my screen and, oh, let's see. Yep, hold on, give me a second. Then we, we, you can just see the code. Why is it not showing it? You know what, let's skip that. You guys have it in front of you. You have it in the staff report. Apparently I'm better on this at Teams than I am on Zoom. Um, it wasn't pulling it up. So anyway, okay. So based on all of that information we provided before, the summary of this is really that the, um, the new code doesn't allow non-conforming uses to be enlarged or expanded, which aligns with the city's current S&P language. And we wanted to make sure that those were um, consistent with one another. We also um, does, it does allow a non-conforming structure to be altered and enlarged so long as it doesn't increase the extent of non-conformity. It also allows a single family resident to be rebuilt in the exact same footprint if it is destroyed, but it may not be enlarged or expanded as the current code allows. So our current code has a lot more deference to single family residential um, than what this proposed code is showing. 
we also revise the terminology um, to call nonconformities, uh, as I said earlier, instead of nonconforming situations uh, combined where we had nonconforming lots um, under nonconforming development. And then we're, I still have to revise and finesse sort of the terminology in the definition sections under 1408, and, and especially under the um, sections of structure and rebuild there is to be determined. I need to work on that a little bit. But we talked about the uh, thresholds for improvements. And there was some discussion about liking city of Marysville's and also at 25% and also thinking that there could be a higher rebuild cost. So I bumped that up to 75%. And then our current code allows for a six month termination period. And so we increased that to 12 months because I, I think we heard feedback that generally that could be increased up to 12 months. I think the biggies um, in terms of getting feedback from you tonight is really what do we do in the sub areas? Because those are areas where the city has a specific vision. Do we want that non-conformities to um, be uh, more conforming sooner rather than later? And then we can make stricter language in those sub areas. And then I did research on the benign versus detrimental, which we talked about last time really is a logical way of approaching non-conformities. But in implementing it, there's a little bit more challenging language. You have to figure out how do we classify these? Do we, um, and, I, and I pulled up a couple different cities which are under attachment three, um, two in Michigan and then Milwaukee, Oregon, which um, David had um, worked at previously. So he knew the language of more intensity. Uh, anyway, classification of benign versus detrimental. You, you can't list every possible use. You know, it's, it's, you would basically have to have some criteria of what is gonna be more benign versus what's detrimental and how they treat those. So that I wanted a little more discussion on. And then also, um, should we allow the expansion of non-conforming uses? A lot of, um, in strictly in zoning law, there's a, a real um, preference not to allow the expansion, but over time there's been more research into these could be expand, uh, certain uses could be expanded if they are not more detrimental in um, intensity. And so you, many cities have a process for going through that, which is a CUP process or going to a hearing body, like a hearing examiner to go through that criteria. And so I'm posing the question whether do we want to do that or we just wanna treat them more collectively. So I did list specific questions for um, your consideration and providing feedback to staff on. And I, when we go through the code, I, I was gonna walk through it a little bit more, just the purpose and intent statement that really, in my mind, is, is just a starter. I think that should be revised to really reflect what we end up with here. So it's really gonna be a summary of what the non-conforming code is, is really ultimately gonna be. And let's see, I talked about, I will still need to define repair and maintenance a little bit more. I wanted your reactions or feedback on specifically the 25% thresholds and the 75% thresholds, are those too high? I know we talked about it last time, but now that you're seeing it in the draft code, does that make sense? Um, and then the 12 months, are you still good with the 12 month abandonment period? So I am happy to um, conclude this presentation and then turn it over to you for further discussion and questions. And I'd like to just walk through it because this is really the first time you're seeing a draft code before you and, and there's a lot of things to consider with non conformities Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I guess we'll open up to the to uh, commissioners. I had a quick question, actually, um, about the amortization clause. Um, could you expand a little bit on that? Yeah. So amortization really means we're going to set a time limit on a, on a non-conforming use. So let's say there's, uh, you know, like a industrial use that is in a residential district. We're going to say this specific type of use um, is allowed, but has to go away after a time period. Some some places use five years, some people you know use ten years, or you could give one year. It's really up to you, but it really is a way of ending that use at some point in the future. So it provides a time limit. Does that help? Yeah, yeah. I'm wondering, are those type of clauses typically applied to um, non-residential, non-conforming uses? I, th I think um, people tend to get concerned and sensitive about um, non-conforming residential uses. Yeah, you know, 
I haven't worked in any jurisdictions that have had them. I know, um, and David might be able to speak a little bit more for Milwaukee because I think they had an amortization clause in theirs. I do think it's more le uh, more slated towards commercial um, and other uses that aren't residential, but certainly could include residential. It just is a matter of how flexible and how strict the jurisdiction wants to be. So if we only want to use it in uses that aren't residential, we could do that, or you could you know, open the whole gamut and open up to everything. But that it doesn't seem like that would be common to do. David, did you have residential amortization in Milwaukee? Just curious. We did not, no, that's something that uh, we had a number of residential neighborhoods in our industrial area um, that had, when they were incorporated, had come in and come in as residential. And so we didn't have an amortization schedule generally just didn't allow for a whole lot of expansion in those areas. And that's how we manage the residential uses there. And I think that's one of the reasons I, I would say, I don't know that we're advocating um, phasing out specific uses. Um, it's easier to do and say sign code where you have a non-conforming sign and you can tell someone you can continue to have this non-conforming sign, but if your business goes away, the next business that comes in doesn't get to have this, this large or otherwise non-conforming structure. That's why in non-conforming code, it focuses more on destruction. If you, if you're building your structure, is demolished by a natural occurrence, a fire, et cetera. And if your threshold to rebuild is such, that's really the way we look at um, moving from a non-conforming use to a conforming use. And it becomes more evident as we look at our remaining, you know, buildable land supply and our economic development goals, that that's really a lot of the reasons we would like to get some of this clarified. So again, as we look to and appreciate remaining land capacity that it's being used for highest and best purpose. And that's, I think, really what we're looking at for phasing out non-conforming versus setting um, timelines, at least how I think staff would like to administer it, because I agree doing some sort of a amateurization clause and timeline um, won't be fun for, for anyone involved. Um, but if there are other mechanisms to get there, I think that's probably, from at least the staff's perspective, our, our preferred way to manage nonconformities. Any other comments? Everything went kind of quiet real quick. <laughs> Uh, I have a quick question, Russ. Um, with our 20th Street Southeast, with a lot of that commercial zoning now, with the idea of destruction at 75%, this could, I'm sorry, this could go to Melissa too, I'm sorry. Um, let's say because we've, we're zoning a lot of now commercial, but we have existing single family residents there. If one of them were to have a, either burn down or have something catastrophic happen, would this then affect them rebuilding their home or not because it's now zoned commercial? Would that be consider non-conforming. Go ahead, Melissa. Yes, it would be considered a non-conforming use because the if the zoning is different than residential, which in the 20th Street the sub area it is, um, generally, I think there's might be very, it's mostly commercial, right? So um, yeah, it, they would not be able to, uh, well, the way this code is written now, if it was a single family residence itself that was completely destroyed, they could rebuild it in the existing footprint. Okay. Um, let's say the abandonment over time, they weren't using it, that then it would have to become a conforming use to that zone. So that's how that would be treated. Okay, so they could still rebuild as long as they just use that same footprint. Correct, they couldn't expand beyond that existing footprint. So there are some difference to still keeping single family residential, if they're completely destroyed and allowing them to rebuild. I mean, I, I think that comes down to, you know, property rights and it's fairly unfair if they completely have a fire and they have no home that they're allowed to rebuild in that same footprint, but they can't expand that. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure of that. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else have any questions or comments? I know it's a lot to go over. Yes, 
Um, I do actually. Hold on. I had. Hold on. On the questions that we were asked, um, I think that uh, I had I had a question just like uh, Commissioner Davis did about the amortization. Um, the hearing body process, and you had mentioned the hearing examiner. Um, I, I personally would think that that's um, a route that uh, I haven't seen be very effective, if I could be so bold, um, when it comes to things within Lake Stevens. So would we have a hearing examiner based in Lake Stevens for something like this? So I, I just, I'm wondering what, what's the difference between staff or planning commission and a hearing examiner. Does that make uh, sense? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We have, we currently have a, a contract with Sound Law, which is provides a hearing body, I'm sorry, hearing examiner services to the city. So for whenever there is a conditional use permit, um, or let's see, they also hear, he hears uh, preliminary plats and uh, other projects that are assigned by the type in the code. But, um, so he's a quasi-judicial land use attorney, basically, that provides land use expertise. And so in this instance, um, if we classified uh, uses um, as a CUP, then that would go before him to make a decision. Um, or there's the option to come before planning commission. I don't believe we have any other um, type, types in the code that come to planning commission other than code amendments and such. We don't have preliminary plats come before planning commission at this time. There's also no, it would be unusual to put a quasi judicial hearing in front of the, the planning commission. Most of Washington has gone to hearing examiner process to separate the legislative body, just like in any um, uh, government body, your judicial and your legislative then are separated. So that answers that question. And then you asked a question at the uh, two, the number six and number seven. Is the city agreeable with adding a story or stories to a building if it doesn't expand the existing building format? Are we talking commercial? Are we talking residential? Uh, what zone are we talking? Um, that's, that's a, a can of worms. Um, not to use that expression twice in one meeting, but um, that would be something that I would think that we'd need to discuss a little bit more. Um, if it doesn't do the existing footprint, that's fine. But if it's changing the nature of that area because it's going to be four stories when everything else is one or you know two, then then I think that that's asking for trouble. Um, and then just to continue on, I'll put myself back on mute, but does the commission want to add specific language about substandard septic systems? And it was my impression that until a septic system fails and has the ability to hook up to sewer, um, the septic system is, is um, fine. So why would we need to add specific language when I think that's already in our um, wording somewhere? We've obviously crossed that before because it's in my brain. So I'll, I'll leave that to be and you can answer if any of those merit. Thank you. Um, I guess I'll have to turn over to uh, Planner Place if we have any. Yeah. On the story um, under non-conforming structures under the new code, I did that, that comes up quite a bit as a question actually. And so we wanted to add language to clarify. Uh, and in general, if you're adding a story, it may not become a problem because you're not expanding beyond the footprint. It may not increase the degree of non-conformity, but sometimes adding a story can create, like if you're adding a story and you're adding more bathrooms, it can create more challenge with um, the health district because they won't allow more bathrooms because the septic is failing or something to that extent. So it gets a little more complicated. You're right. You can have more discussion on that extent. Um, I, I, so the language is in is proposed right now in C and to add additional, allow additional stories as long as it meets all other provisions of city state code. So there, there's kind of the catch all is, is the 
it's a problem somewhere else in another code, then that might be something that isn't allowed. Um, try to write it like that in case of a situation, like I just explained, it has come up before. But we've had folks ask, well, can I add a story on? It's like, well, our non-conforming code doesn't really talk about it. It talks about increasing the degree of non-conformity. So then as staff, we have to look at, is adding a story increasing the degree of non-conformity? And we start to look at, okay, what are the setbacks? Is it increasing it? Where is it at? So we, it starts to get a little bit more, um, well, you have to take a look at it. And in this case, I just wanted to clarify whether it would be allowed or not. So we can answer that question and more forth, forthcoming at the counter. So you're looking at somebody's rambler was destroyed and they decided they wanted to rebuild in the same footprint, but go a couple of stories instead, would that be allowed then, right? Uh, <clears throat> well, this is on specifically on non-conforming structures. So let's see, yes. Um, well, if it was, that's a great question. If it was a new, if it was destroyed and it was a new, um, they're building from new, they would basically not be able to increase beyond the built print, but they could put additional stories on. That's the way I'm interpreting that new code. Okay. It's a little different than we've treated them before. Yeah, it's interesting. And when you talk about substandard to kind of build on uh, what uh, Commissioner Huxford just said, when you said about substandard se septic systems, is that considered failing or just considered not with current um, standard industry standards, I guess? I'm trying to figure out how to say I, that. Yeah, I think when I wrote that question, I was thinking more about failing septic sy systems that are failing, not that they are um, not conforming. Because basically, if, it's, if you're a septic and you've got approval from health district, you're conforming, you're just not hooked up to city sewer. But it's more about those systems that are failing. Yeah, a good distinction. Is there, if someone gets, if sewers gets ran to an area that has septic already, but sewer is becomes available, is there a point where they have to hook up to the sewer or do they just run on septic if they want to until it fails? Yeah, no, that's a good question. So they are required to hook up to sewer, I believe, if it's within, I'm trying to recall, this is a, um, sorry, public, public works code, but 200 feet. 200 feet. 100 feet, thank you. Okay. Yeah, if it's within that close to the property, they're required to hook up to sewer. Okay. But there's some exceptions in the code that allow um, the public works director and the sewer district to um, allow them to remain on septic if, if there are certain things they need. So, but generally speaking, that is the rule. Great. I was kind of wanting to ask the commission how they felt about the, um, I'm looking at the questions myself uh, as I'm looking at my, um, the sub areas. Do we want to treat those more strictly or not with all the um, groups that we've had getting involved, whether it be the downtown sub area plan or for other areas, do we want to be stricter or not stricter on what we're looking for? Has anybody had any input on that? I can, I, I've been mulling that over since we've been discussing this. Um, I think that's so tough. Um, we, I, I was on the commission when we worked on those sub areas and it was uh, so much work the staff put into those plans and that we did. Um, but it's really hard to think about applying different standards across the city because I, I may, I may be um, under the wrong impression, but our, and I should ask, are most of the um, situations involving non-conforming uses involving res single family residences? Is that kind of like the majority of what you typically see? I would tend to say yes, and, and other staff can chime in, but I, I, we do get a lot of non-conforming residential um, structures uh, so dimensional nonconformities and uses in different zoning districts. So I, I would probably say 70% are residential that are what I have been asked over time at the city about. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think that's a fair statement. I think we were probably seeing them more as we do more annexation. People have gotten used to a less city. You know, the, the those areas aren't quite used to some of the uh, same the county and us don't have diff have different ideas of how things look. So I can see nonconformity maybe more out to our areas that we're just annexing or will annex in the near future. I would guess. I'm torn, honestly. I was hoping we'd have a kind of a robust conversation about it. Um, 
I think it, it would, I really am honestly torn about it. It would be nice to sort of speed the process of development in the sub areas by having imposing stricter standards in this, in this, but this is such a, an emotional topic for people in our city. Um, when it comes to their homes. They get very concerned that they're going to be forced to change or something will happen and they'll have to change or not be able to continue doing what they're doing. And because it's their home, they, they're, I think, more concerned. Um, so I'm curious what other commissioners have to, have to say, since I've offered absolutely no opinion <laughs> as of yet, but I'm curious. I would have to agree that I, th I think it's more, it, that's a hard, it's hard whether or not we want to treat the city, like you said, different in different areas. I would say with the amount of work that we have put in with some of these sub areas, I, I would more look to a stricter standard in those areas, just off the top of my head, but that's without any other input. That's just probably because I've also spent so many years working on some of these things, like, like many of you have. So it, you kind of take a, you see a vision and you kind of don't want anything to get in the way of that. So I don't want to be, I don't want to interfere with people's property rights, but at the same time, I think there's, there's been a lot of work done to get these areas to a certain degree or certain standard. And I'd like for us to kind of not get off that path if at all possible, if that makes sense. Uh, yeah, I, I would agree with Commissioner Welch and Commissioner Davis. Um, you know, at the end of the day, I have a, I have a tough time telling somebody, you know, yeah, you bought this piece of property, but now we're going to, you know, amortize you down and out of it in a short period of time without some sort of, some sort of carrot or compensation that might be associated with it. And at the same time, I also don't want to stand in the way of, you know, a, a, a robust, you know, vision for an area. Um, as you know, I, I guess I would just say if if somebody's going to be if if a, if a property right is going to be a bridge, then there needs to be some means of compensation for it. Are we talking imminent domain? I mean, are we talking then? Then you get into some real crosshairs. Um, yeah, yeah. I guess I, I guess in some ways I am though, because if you if we want them out that bad, uh, that we want to treat them special. Um, on a piece of property, I think, you know, maybe that's a tool that might have to be looked at. I, I don't, I, just for the group, that's really not something that's on the table and just cities cannot use that authority for economic development. It has to be for specific public purpose. So that really doesn't come into the equation here. It's just, I think the question is, if we were, for example, our current code has the valuation set at 50%. If it's destroyed and the value of the destruction is over 50% of the, the building, then it would have to come into conformity. And I think that's the, the bigger tool. And then as proposed now, moving that number to 75% of the value, you've now done a 25% disincentive for the vision of the city to be moved on. So it's really that valuation number that's the really important thing to look at and the biggest tool the city would have in achieving a vision, whether it's in the sub area, or as I mentioned earlier, just the highest and best used based on any zoning. For example, in our industrial area, where we've not completed significant um, sub area plan yet, but we will, there are still lots of small single family homes in that area and that take up, you know, in one perspective, valuable industrial land. And so I think that's more the, the question at hand is not that the city would take these. Again, we wouldn't be in a position to do that unless it's for a defined public benefit, a park, a road, you know, stormwater facility. It's what is the assessed value that a property should be allowed to continue? That's, I think, really the, the tool in question. Well, if we use the assessed value, I like the idea of going up to 75%. I, I worry as, well, like right now we're in a, um, a, a time of kind of inflation is rising right now, whether, you know, everybody wants to, what anybody wants to call inflation, 
the, right now the building costs are extensive. I think a, a new house right now is adding 30 to 40 grand just in material alone than what it was two years ago. So I would rather see something like 75% quotes. That would then cover things when you have unusual inf inflationary times would be a concern of mine when it comes to what's assessed value and then what should be built on or the number, excuse me. I don't know if any other commissioner any input on the 50, 75, 100, whatever you would consider. I think I would comment that that for me taking an amortization, and I think it sounds like other commissioners too, maybe taking the idea of an amortization clause off the table makes me feel better about um, kind of protecting existing property owners. Um, but I guess, I guess I don't have a problem with treating the sub areas differently um, in terms of, it doesn't feel like a, a taking of anything um, for the current property owners or their ability to sell that property. Um, and I don't know, maybe we could talk about whether we like 50% or 75%, but I, I think I come down on the idea if we, we don't have amortization clauses that set a time certain when you can no longer have the non-conforming use, um, if that's just off the table for me, then um, I think I would be okay with treating the sub areas differently. That, I think that's what I, where I come down on it. So would you think a different percentage then for the sub areas? Is that what you would be saying or? Yeah, if the, where are we at on the, the, the parts of the city that are not in the sub areas? I can't, I'm having trouble flipping back and forth for my screens. Are you asking in the code in the proposed code? Yeah, I, for some reason I can't get my packet to come up. I'm having a tech problem. But I didn't. Um, the proposed code does not specify any difference in the sub areas. It was just uh, simply a question if we want to. So I, I, there's no language in there that currently treats the sub areas any differently than anywhere else in the city. Got it. Okay. Whether this the commission or the city would like to do that. So and the, the proposed language says seventy five percent. Is that where we're at for? Uh, so that is really about the non conforming structure. So if you have a structure that is um, destroyed, then um, you can, if it exceeds seventy five percent, it cannot be uh, reconstructed. But if it's under that, it can be. So that's under fourteen thirty two oh four oh non conforming structures, and then the twenty five percent is really about repair and maintenance. Mm -hmm. So maybe the sub area would look something like 60%, 50%, 65%. I mean, there's a there's a whole range under 75% that we could consider to kind of encourage the sub areas to develop as planned. I would I would disagree respectfully. I would I would uh, make it all consistent and leave it and put it at 75. Um, again, just. Um, to keep things simple for one, and to make it not look like there is um, a predestined path um, for for some folks that I just think back to that meeting that we had a couple of years ago with that full group of people in that that room that you know, and there was a gentleman who sits right there on on twenty. I pass his, his house every day who is asking about and, and, you know, and what's happening to my yard. And I swear every time I go past his house, he's got three feet less of grass in front of his house. So I just think that it, keeping it simple would be um, how I would prefer. I think that amortization can come out completely. And I don't think that there needs to be specific language about substandard septic systems. I think that people should be able to uh, once there's fail, have the ability to hook up uh, with everything else that goes on with putting in a septic system. Um, I think that there are other governing bodies that are overseeing that. And then the, we already, I already talked about the different stories. So that's all for me on this one. Thank you, though. Thank you. Um, anyone else have any comments they'd like to add to, to air to the questions or to the discussion we've had so far.
I want to say, um, I guess I'd like to move on real quick on this to the one last thing I was wanting to look at was the benign versus detrimental nonconformities. Um, I guess I'd have to ask uh, Planner Place, what would you, when it comes to benign and detrimental, what are we looking, is that looking for a change in the code on that or how would we look to pursue that? Yeah, it was really just um, in doing the research on non-conforming codes and how other jurisdictions treat them. There, there are some that um, distinguish between that and it was, um, I, I think it's a novel idea, but I think it's really hard to implement. So the reality of that, I think, is probably um, it's, it's a great idea and we can certainly change the language in the code to reflect that if that's what the commission desires. But looking at those examples that I provided, the only there's only a few of them that I could find literally in the in the US. It was very difficult, even though there were apparently more places that have done it. I couldn't actually find code language that reflected that. Um, and probably for this reason, because it sounds great, but it's really hard to implement. So whatever the commission desires on that, I, I'm happy with. I, I just the code right now, the proposed code does not include that, but whether you want to include it or not is the question. Yeah, as, as the examples show, and I think as you're just saying, I think it might be a little bit too complicated if we were to add, personally, I believe if we were to add that right now, I think it'd be a little bit beyond what we're looking to do, personally. If anybody has any other ideas on that? I agree with you, Commissioner Welch, on that. Yeah. Does anyone have any other comments or discussion they wish to have on this at this minute? Uh, Planner Place, is there anything you else need? For, would there be more that you need from us at this point or how we want to move forward here? Yeah, so it's just in general, I was going to say, um, you know, but it sounds like you've given me some direction on the questions and response to the questions and, and are fairly uncomfortable with some of those and not changing the code from what it is right now. So it sounds like the proposed code may reflect what the commission desires. If the next step is to um, basically bring it to a public hearing, do you want me to bring it back for in September for another look at it and more discussion on, on you know, get more to the, into the details of the code or would you, are you ready to go public hearing? I don't know that we're there. There's a lot of detail in there, but I, I just, you know, um, guide me on the next step that you want to take. Sure. Uh, personally, I, I per, if it was up to me, I'd like to see it before one more time before it goes to a public hearing because then we would have what we consider the best until we get public input, what we have for it. So personally, I would like to see it come back right before it comes to go to public hearing. If anybody, if anybody has a difference in opinion, that'd be great to hear. But that's what I'd like to see first. I agree. I also agree. And I'd like Chair Cronin to be able to weigh in on it one more yeah. time as well. And I agree also. That would be another, yeah, another briefing would be good. Perfect. That sounds good. I There was things, you know, I had mentioned I need to finesse the in purpose and intent and some of the definitions. So when I bring it back in September, it will be fully fleshed out. That'll be the goal. And were we all kind of in agreement to remove the amortization? Was that pretty much a, we're kind of don't want to have that there? As a, as a direction for planner place. Yeah, I agree. I agree with the removal. Me too. Right. Great. I agree. I think we all agree on that. All right. Great. So I think we have, all have that. I guess that's done. <laughs> um, so we will move on. Thank you, uh, planner place. That was a great, I think we had a great discussion. I think we got a lot done. Hopefully, hopefully um, you have a good direction to move forward from us. Yes, appreciate all the input. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we'll move on to commissioner's report. So I will move around as I see everybody on my screen. Commissioner Doerr? No report tonight, thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Davis? Uh, I have only one thing that is um, the, the local pharmacies in town are currently offering booster vaccines for immunocompromised people. Um, so that was news to me today and I thought I'd pass that along. Thank you. Commissioner Huxford. I have um, two things. I've been asked to ask for a buildable land map 
um, with newly acquired annexations, wondering what the ETA is on something for buildable land. Don't all jump up at once. That's mm -hmm. been asked by the community, but that's a request. The second is, again, another request. There was a promise made during the discussions on the annexation, specifically on the southeast side of the lake, that the speed limit um, be changed down to 25 miles per hour. That promise was made by the, the mayor. Um, he was also going to make sure that we had police patrol um, on this end of the lake. And um, I'm just uh, reminding staff and the city council members that are on the call that that promise was made and um, has resonated here. So it's been brought up. And then my personal suggestion, not to call anybody out, but my personal suggestion is that that speed limit could start with the city vehicles that are now going between um, the Tom Thumb area and uh, the downtown area. Um, I, I, I see them often and I can tell you exactly who's honoring the current speed limit and who would have a really hard time with 25 miles an hour because they're, they're blowing through here. So please, please be cognizant of the fact that we've got kids with strollers, kids on bikes, joggers, me, um, and lower your speed, please. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Holt. Um, I was wondering, have, um, will there be a time in the near future where we can actually meet in person instead of doing the Zooming? That's an interesting question. I think we'll have to propose that to staff and uh, see what the health district, I think is gonna be more depending on what the health district is saying right yeah. now, if I would know right well, from them. It's just that when we at least meet in person, I feel like we get a lot more um, feedback from the public. Cause I think there's a lot of folks who don't understand how to Zoom. Um, and it would just be nice to be able to meet in person, of course, be safe and all that kind of stuff. But it would just, I think there'd be a lot more input from Lake Stevens residents if we were meeting in person. That's what I was thinking. So that's it. And Commissioner Oslin. Uh, no report tonight. Thanks. All right. And I will have uh, no report report as a commissioner. I will say real quick, I'm um, sorry, uh, just remind everybody if there's any community watching that the uh, Veterans Commission is having their monthly coffee clatch. If no one knows what a clatch is, you can always, it's an interesting word, but it's basically it's a coffee meeting of veterans and spouses of veterans and we'll be meeting this Saturday morning um, at the Veterans Memorial area. So. Um, so if anybody wants to go out and have coffee and talk, especially as more recent trying times have happened for us who have served in certain regions of the world, um, I think some veterans might be having problems with what has happened over the world over the last few days. So just a little moment, which really has nothing to do with planning, but I like to put it out there when I can. So other than that, I guess we will turn it over to uh, Director Wright. Okay, thank you. Just a, a couple of items for the, the commission tonight. The first one, um, response to Commissioner Holt. Um, the city council has pushed back when they're going to be starting their in-person meetings. So we will follow suit with planning commission and other boards. My guess is probably not in September, um, just with the new mandates that came down new mask mandates across the board. So um, I'm guessing another month or two before we um, think about in-person meetings, but again, we'll continue to monitor that. To the other part of your comment, I think we've actually seen the opposite happen in some of the venues at city council, um, definitely at park board, we've had very extensive crowds um, being able to use the, the Zoom and other platforms. So I, I think it's a, a different crowd that we're hearing from, but I wouldn't say that um, we're still not getting input. Um, then I wanted to touch on um, 
the annexation, you've already heard about that, that the annexation is complete. The welcome letters have gone out to that community as well as a request to complete their census. And we'll be working with our public works and our police over the coming weeks to uh, figure out what steps are going to happen first there with you know speed limit and maintenance and all of those other things. So those are discussions we're having with public works and police. And then I just wanted to let the commission know that the city council will be having their summer retreat this Friday. It'll be focused on budget, capital priorities for 2022. There will also be a discussion on the city hall library campus and then a discussion on parks. And I'm happy to take any questions from the commission if you, you have any. Uh, Russ, to uh, I guess one of the commissioners asked about buildable lands. Now we, I know we did a buildable lands report mm -hmm. prior to any annexations. I don't remember, did that cover the UGA or just city limits at that point? That report was primarily the lands capacity that we did a couple of years ago was just the city limits. Um, thank you for bringing that up. We did just complete um, the review of the new buildable lands report with the planning advisory committee in Snohomish County. That's gone on to the steering committee and should be headed to the executive committee. So after that plan is formally adopted, I will definitely be bringing that back to the, the planning commission for your information. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. All right. Does anybody have any other questions, comments, or any other thing to say? Yes, if I may, Commissioner Weld. Of course, uh, Council Member. Correct. Russ, I think you indicated the council was retreat was this Friday. It's actually a week from this Friday. Thank you for that. So if anyone would like to zoom in and and uh, participate, well, I guess listen in, I guess you can't participate, but listen in, certainly welcome. So a week from this Friday. Thank you. Thank you so much. Anyone else have anything? All right, with that, I would ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second, or what? I guess I can second it too. <laughs> so we have a motion and a second to adjourn. All approved? Aye. 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 All right. Thank you all so much and see you all at the second time meeting in um, September. So remember, it'll be in the, in the later part of the month. My calendar is not in front of me, so I can't give you the exact date. But so, that, everybody have a good time and uh, stay safe. Thank you.